Black Ops 2, the greatest Call of Duty title ever, and one that took Call of Duty from being a modern shooter with elements of schizophrenia and turned it into one set in the future. Black Ops 2 was designed by Treyarch, a studio that has been revered for designing some of the best games in the entire franchise, from World at War, best known for its dark, gritty design, to Black Ops 1, best known for casting Ice Cube, who is best known for being a part of the rap group Nick. Treyarch, this time around, tried to develop a game with a multiplayer experience centered around competitive gameplay and, ahem, <clears throat> fun, while also developing a campaign that gave the player choices that could affect the game's overall story. Did this work? Sure. I'd say a large part of that success comes from the fact that Call of Duty games during this time were at the peak of their popularity, and by just slapping Call of Duty on the box meant it was going to shatter records, kind of like Taylor Swift. Yet unlike some other games in the franchise, the success of Black Ops 2 was deserving, delivering the player base, a campaign that introduced everyone to one of the best villains gaming has ever seen, choices that could potentially rip your heart out, and those lovable Michael Bay moments that fans have come to know and love. A multiplayer that is still looked at as one of the best we've ever gotten, along with competitive gameplay unlike any other Call of Duty title, and a zombies that continued that whole round-based survival we've all come to know and love. The campaign continues a bit of the story found in the original game. We get returning characters like Mason, Frank fucking Woods, and BALD! BALD! We also get introduced to one of the best villains since A-Rod named Raul Menendez. A psychopath hell-bent on destroying America by accessing its infrastructure and rallying the people to his cause so that way he can avenge the death of his sisters, Josefina. Spoilers. There was also some legal issues involving the use of real people like Jonas Savimbi and Noriega as they, or their families, didn't like how they were portrayed in the game. Please don't sue me, I'm just here. The campaign jumps time periods from the 1980s and 2025. So like one second you could be in the 1980s, leading a horseback charge in Afghanistan, then the very next mission be on a floating city in the middle of the ocean. What the shit? Give me a future that makes me look sexy, I'm all for it. God damn, I look good. There's also this element to the game involving your choices. Throughout the campaign, the player is given a list of choices, which will end up having an impact on the game's grand finale. For instance, do you choose to spare Harper and expose Fareed's double crossing? Maybe you shoot Mason in the head, spoilers, or shoot him in the kneecap, no offense to Frank Woods, or maybe you choose to martyr Menendez instead of bringing him in. No matter the choices, we realize it all doesn't matter because we learn Woods is just lazy and Menendez was actually a giant wimp as they rock out with Avenge Sevenfold. The campaign also allows players to fully customize their loadout. For instance, do you stick with the period weapons or maybe you jump into the 80s through the power of the multiverse and bring a gold-plated AN-94? Decisions, decisions. The zombies mode is a blast as you have various maps that continue that peak from Black Ops 1. We also get introduced to a new map called Transit, which gave the players a large map to play on. Players can be driven around on a bus by a guy I like to call Gus, because get it? Gus. Bus. Get it? Get it? <clears throat> you just lost your membership in video spot! Dang it. There were also a bunch of other maps, but one that always seems to stick out to me is the one where you get to play on Alcatraz and fight hordes of zombies. Can someone fucking help me? Has anyone noticed this franchise is a weird obsession with Alcatraz? No? Just me? Have no fear, my zombies players, because you can still find a match in every single zombies map in Black Ops 2. Though I would expect people to back out after, like, round 11, because people's attention spans have pretty much gone into the gutter since I was a kid. Thanks, TikTok. But if you want an experience, then you may want to look towards the multi player, but if you're looking for a Black Ops 2 multiplayer experience in 2024, well, it's pretty much unplayable. Black Ops 2 is one of the greatest multiplayers ever, but in recent years it seems to have been taken over by underpopulation issues and cheaters. Oh my god, the cheaters! Genuine question here, what is the appeal to cheating in a video game that's like over 10 years old? Is it just a nice flex when talking to your friends at your middle school lunch table? Or maybe you just desperately want attention? No matter what it is, you can still get the help you need. Which is why I've made a call to Minnesota Burns to come out of retirement to hopefully help this cheating issue. Problem is, he may be banging your mom, much like like GOP candidate Zachariah Milfunder Wilson. Oh, the price we pay for freedom. It's weird though, because I've had a few scenarios play out. One, the cheater will ruin the entire game for everyone but themselves, putting their character to god mode and destroying everyone in the lobby. That sounds fun. Two, the cheater will make the game somewhat funny by including crates with turrets in the middle of the map and spawn players up there midway through the game or spawn you out of the map. Or three, give you a free prestige lobby, though nothing is free in life and this rarely happens. Listen, being honest, I could care less if you cheat, as long as your powers of evil 
evil are being used to make the experience fun for everyone instead of using those said powers for your own personal gain. Because if you end up using those for your personal gain, then guess what? You're a... Loser. Loser. Besides cheaters, Black Ops 2 also seems to have population issues, with the average player on the Xbox being under a thousand. If this kind of thing shocks you at all, then you're probably going to be even more shocked to find out banks have therapists known as wealth psychologists who help clients who are unable to mentally cope with their immense wealth. That's crazy. Like, imagine being so wealthy that you need to have someone work you through just how wealthy you are. Speaking of coping, Black Ops 2 is 12 years old, so it's unsurprising that not many people are online playing it in comparison to 2012. The issue is this can make it quite difficult to find a match. Not to mention if you have any of the map packs installed, this may even affect your matchmaking because apparently the people playing in 2024 don't own the map packs. So no peacekeeper for you. Looking at the list of options for game modes, your options range from TDM to TDM to search and destroy to gun game to everyone's personal favorite TDM which is a shame because you end up missing out on one of my personal favorite game modes multi-team which basically gives you just three teams of three players that go up against each other in a competitive style of play and casual despite all the cheaters and population issues black ops 2 is still incredibly fun the game holds up very well being arguably better than recent titles despite being a 12 year old game with clear issues that are really out of its own control, which stems from a broader problem of Activision not really fixing any of their games beyond their lifespan except for like really rare instances. The more I've played certain things that I hated originally, like the Pick 10 system have really started to grow on me, a system that acts similar to the traditional custom class system, but also has the player to trade off. So say you want three attachments, it could come at the cost of a perk or an equipment. Not to mention the various maps and how each of them plays seemingly different than one another is something that is missing from current day Call of Duty titles, which is probably why they constantly remaster the ones from Black Ops 2. Also even in the year 2024, the DSR is still by far the best sniper rifle in the entire game, so no need to keep sending angry tweets to Uncle Vondi. The camos in this game are absolutely S tier, especially the DLC camos. Like look at these things, my god, tell me this doesn't make you want to whip out your parents credit card and scream take my money. The one downside of the multiplayer is the fact that this was the first game to include DLC weapons, which has since pretty much ruined Call of Duty, which is called the Peacekeeper. Which is pretty ironic because it did the exact opposite. The Peacekeeper was a pretty solid weapon of choice. Being listed under the SMG tier, the Peacekeeper always felt like a cross hybrid of an SMG and an assault rifle, mainly due to its close quarters damage like Antonio Brown on a punt return. And now Brown is off to the races! Hurdles kicks a man! And a flag is thrown. It also had decent range, which is basically like saying it's big enough for me, not saying that's from personal experience though, sup Lisa. Though the Peacekeeper could be beaten out by things like the MSMC or PDW, the reason why the gun was just such a big deal is because they locked it behind a paywall. The first of its kind, if you didn't own the Revolution map pack, you were, for lack of better words, shit out of luck. Either you bought the Revolution DLC or you didn't, because you probably have some self-control and refuse to pay money for just a new DLC weapon. I mean, you do get some new maps and stuff, and I guess those new maps are pretty solid. All right, take my money. But the real appeal was the Peacekeeper, which was a monster on the field. Yet with all that being said, Black Ops 2 was a peak experience, one that has since been looked at as the poster child for what Call of Duty games should be. Suck it, Activision.